Hello everyone, I was recently reached out to by someone who was getting a MuleSoft flow back pressure error in their application. I reviewed the application with them and we were able to identify and fix the issue. Afterwards, I thought this would be a great video topic, not only for the issue we're trying to solve, but kind of the code review that it turned into. In this video, I'm going to recreate that code review and how we solved the back pressure issue on a stripped down version of the application. Let's get into it. The developer was building this application for the first time and had it running on their QA environment. Basically what it's supposed to do is pull records from an enterprise system SaaS application called Cornerstone. There are a lot of organizations that have learning or training modules for their employees. And periodically on a scheduler, they need to pull those data from a REST API and insert them into their EDW database. When running it, they notice that they are missing records in the database. So the record count in Cornerstone was more than the number of records inserted inside the database. When going into their MuleSoft logs, they found this error. Flow, flow name is unable to accept new events at this time. Reason max concurrency exceeded. And then the MuleSoft error type was Mule flow back pressure. And that's when they approached me to try to understand what this error message meant. The great thing about this error message, it actually tells you the flow name that it's occurring on. So the first thing I did was go check out this flow, transcript cornerstone EDW service flow. I've recreated the application as much as I can with all the other stuff that's not needed. So only kept the flow that was causing the issue. So here is the flow transcript cornerstone EDW services flow. So what I see is it's a scheduler and then it's pulling up from the object store and last updated time, which is used in a query as the from time. And then the to time is used as I'm assuming there's a no, a now in there. Yes. So a current timestamp. And then this from and to is used to query Cornerstone through an HTTP request. And Cornerstone has a max number of fields that it will reply with. And if your time range selects more than this an amount, it'll send you back at the bottom of the payload another URL that you can go fetch the next set of records. And then once you make that HTTP request, if it has another link, you follow that one for the next set until that link isn't there anymore. And then you know you've reached the end of the record set. So for each single response, that data is taken, transformed, put into a database. And then we do that check to see if there's a link at the bottom of the payload. We call it OData next link. And if it's there, then we, we run this whole process again recursively. And if not, then we, we end a flow. So my first question was, well, how many times do you usually have to call Cornerstone to get all the records? And the answer they told me was it depends on how wide our time frame is. On our scheduler, it is set up to be every six hours. So that means four times a day. It's actually not running in central time. Um, when you're using a cron expression, it's always UTC time in the MuleSoft scheduler. So this is just ignored. So they say with six hour gaps between the from and the to search range, they can usually get anywhere between four pages to up to 10. If it's that low, you don't have to go through all the level to make um, an external queue while loop. You can just use flow references. But the developer said that initially they'll have to do a data migration to bring back years worth of data as well as if there's ever an issue, sometimes in the past, they've had to load in a whole month's worth. So in that case, they said that the, lo the loops may be like a thousand. So in that case, yes, I do, I do recommend switching to an external queue. VMQ is, a, is all right, but external to for that many. So if you're using a flow ref while loop, by default, MuleSoft will only let you do 25 loops. They do this to try to protect the server from crashing, 
but you can overwrite it with a configuration max concurrent size, I believe it's called, but you are pushing the limits of the application. So in general, if this application is ever going to encounter more than 30 or 40, and especially if it's shared with other flows and processes, I recommend switching to a do while loop using a queue. I really like what they're doing here. What they're doing is they're logging a timestamp or saving it in a variable of when this process starts. If you anticipate a long running process and you want to keep track of the, how long it's typically taking, you take a timestamp at the start of the process and then you should have one at the very end when you realize there's no more data links, which is the process duration. And then you take the, the timestamp at the end minus the timestamp you took in the start. And then that's how many milliseconds it is. And I'm assuming they print it out here somewhere. Yes, they're, they're putting it back into the payload that comes back. But it's also great if you could log it which they're doing with the payload, which I don't recommend this printing out payloads. But I guess in this case, it's all right because it's not the customer data or the source system data. It's actually a summary of the payload you just set before. So there's no chance of any sensitive data, which is great. So returning to the back pressure issue. So the first thing I need to confirm is whether this application is getting triggered on time or not. So it should be every six hours. So I can go into the past logs and see if, if it's been triggering on time. And they have a logger at the very start of the flow telling me that this job is triggered, which I absolutely love. And in this case, gives me a search string to run against the logs. And this is what I come up with. So the job is still running, which is great. 22 and three in the morning. So that is five hours difference. And then three and eight, that's five hours, five hours. So I, I just need to double check the cron expression. So if I copy and paste into one of these online cron expression generators and hit describe, it'll say that it's starting at midnight every six hours. So six hours actually works out to exactly four. So if this was five hours, it wouldn't get a full run in the last one at night because it would trigger again at midnight. But six hours goes evenly. So I'm not sure why that's five hours. Maybe it was a change in the code when it was deployed. But anyways, it's definitely triggering on the hour and it's not hung up. So that's great. The next thing I need to investigate is if this is successfully running every five hours, why would I be getting the error message telling me that max concurrency exceeded. How long is one execution taking to complete? So the object store calls don't take a lot of time. The question is how long is this cornerstone API call taking? So having this log right here is actually quite valuable. As well as there was one before the sec, the looping request to cornerstone right here. So using these, I was able to determine that, that every once in a while, the cornerstone request would just never come back and it was hanging up on there. It would have been a little easier to find if we had a, if we had a logger after the HTTP request, but you probably wouldn't know that to do that off the start. It might be useless, but if you are finding yourself that some of these requests are taking a long time, it'd be great to find out of whether the hang up is before or after cornerstone. So now we know that cornerstone is, is the issue that sometimes it just doesn't respond. So the question is, well, why would that create back pressure? And it wasn't until I started snooping around that when I clicked on this flow, I noticed that it was set to max concurrency one. And this is where it all started to make sense. So what this means is that there's only ever maximum one execution of this flow going on at one time, or you can think of it as only a max of one thread is able to process requests through this flow. So to explain what was happening is the schedule would kick off at midnight. It would run through here. It would get to the first call to Cornerstone and the Cornerstone wouldn't reply. So it would just be holding, holding, holding until six hours would go by. At 6 a.m., the schedule would kick off. However, it wouldn't be able to execute because the previous execution 
or the kind of concept of one thread is already used up. So in that case, MuleSoft would throw the back pressure error saying that it wasn't able to execute this flow, transcript cornerstone EDW, because there's no more execution flows available or there's no more threads available. And that's exactly what it told us. So at 6 a.m. in the morning when the scheduler kicked off, the flow transcript cornerstone services flow was already busy. So it's unable to accept the new scheduler event or the new execution at this time because the max concurrency is exceeded. So the max concurrency was one. It can't go up to two because we hard coded it. And that's the error called the flow back pressure. So I asked, why was this set to max concurrency? And their answer was they noticed that during the loop flow, sometimes there'd be more than one execution going at once. Messages piling up on the queue when there only should be one. But in that case, it doesn't make sense to put the concurrency here. So theoretically, these flows aren't tied together. Because if you notice the schedule kicks off, it goes into reference flow. It makes one call to Cornerstone, but then publishes a message. So once it publishes this message, this is async. That's the end of the flow. So this returns back right away. This doesn't wait. All the records from all the loops have been loaded. So if you're worried about too many messages, I recommend you putting the max concurrency on this flow that re adds the subscriber to the queue. And they did have it set here. So I recommend keeping this here and taking this away. I did recommend that they don't let one API call potentially hang up their whole application forever. So for the, if you notice that Cornerstone does take a lot of time to reply, I do recommend that you play around with your timeout settings on that request. And then it opens up a whole number of conversation about what's your error handling if you do timeout of this request. But that could be a whole nother video. Maybe I'll add it to the architecting series. So that handled this situation. But just to make this video a little bit longer, I just want to kind of explain a few other cases. So if you don't set max concurrency, MuleSoft doesn't have a max concurrency set in the background, but they do have a limited number of threads. And that equation is, it's based on a few things like your server size, CPU count, that type of stuff. So we kind of self-impose this scenario with setting mass concurrency to a low number. But I've also seen this error in other situations, but they weren't dealing with a scheduler kicking off the flow. It was an HTTP request. And in that case, we actually ran out of the threads that MuleSoft was providing. So I drew out the visual of that here. So instead of querying Cornerstone and getting back thousands of records, say in real time, Cornerstone sent us every time they had a record. And for some reason, the application's really busy at one time, or they have a batch processing on their side that just generated a whole bunch of transcripts all at once. And they just fired and forget a whole bunch of requests to us. So what would happen is in our Cornerstone X API, we have an HTTP listener, which has a limited number of threads based again on your server size, based on MuleSoft's engine of what they determine is a good number to allocate to the application. And if you get a barrage that's over that number that it can handle, then what's going to happen is some of them are just going to be rejected. And in this case, you'll see the exact same error in your error handling. And then where the flow with your HTTP listener will be listed as the flow that cannot accept more requests. But this case is actually more dangerous because if you block a request, you don't know that it arrived. You don't have a way to reprocess it. But in the schedule request here, we were actually using timestamps. So if this got rejected, this object store timestamp wouldn't get updated because this wouldn't run. The next time that this actually picked up and there was a thread to execute it, it would retrieve the update stamp from the last successful run, which was a few schedule execution ago. One question that the developer did bring up, which was a great point, is what happens if they expect the execution to take longer than six hours? So in that case, if they remove that max concurrency of one, 
the scheduler will kick off again, pull the exact same data, and start making duplicates into the database. And in that case, there actually is an unknown flag that you can set on your scheduler, but it's not through the UI, it's through the code. The attribute is named disallow concurrent execution. The description is that it skips the next scheduled flow execution if the last one has not ended. So that means if this scheduler kicks off and it detects that the previous one hasn't ended yet, what it'll do is that flag is set, it'll just skip it and say, hey, it's busy, I'll come back in six hours and try to run that time. And to set that, you have to go to your configuration XML, find the scheduler, and then just append it on the end here. Uh, set that to true, and then save it. So either having a scheduler or an HTTP listener as your flow trigger are the two main areas that you need to protect against being overwhelmed with requests. And as I mentioned before, the developer made the updates I recommended, and the good news is that it's now successfully running in production. So that wraps up this code review. Let me know in the comment section below if you enjoyed this type of video. It's a little bit more practical because these are actually live, these are actually real world use cases and real world code. So let me know if it was valuable. If you enjoyed the video, hit a thumbs up. And if you're interested in more videos on MuleSoft technology, please subscribe. Well, thanks for watching and you see you next time. Peace. Oh.